last week we looked at the fact that that Lazarus was was sick and uh, John gives some backstory on who Lazarus and Mary and Martha were um, their relationship with Christ Christ love for them and then we see this um, very interesting thing play out that really uh, keeps beckoning back to the man that is born blind. I think it's very interesting that several times after the miracle of the man who was born blind, um, the Gospel of John beckons back to it. And this is yet another chapter where that happens. And I, I think um, what is so interesting about and we need to remember that that um, John, when he wrote the Gospel of John under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he was very specific and intentional in the seven miracles that he included in this book. And you, I mean, you, we just have to be very careless to not stop and say, why these seven miracles? And I think it is interesting to me, the man that is born blind, um, is such an interesting miracle because of what it says in regards to the Trinity, what it says in regards to Jesus being at the creation of the universe, at the creation of man. Let us make man in our image. And taking that dirt and creating a new eyeball from it, reminiscent of God uh, making Adam out of the dust, the dirt of the ground, and then breathing life into him. and. So we keep seeing that after that miracle, um, this uh, revisiting of this miracle back uh, from from the crowd, from the Jews, from people. I just think that's very interesting. And uh, after uh, this whole uh, incident of, of, of Christ saying, well, Lazarus is dead, basically. And he says, I'm glad that you were not there um, when he died, but that his death has been for the glory of God. Now, what's interesting about Lazarus and the man born blind is that in both of these miracles, Jesus says that these miracles are being done for the glory of God. Uh, in the man born blind, the disciples say, um, who sinned? this man or his parents and jesus said neither um but this man was born blind so that god could be glorified and in the same way uh christ tells the disciples that that uh lazarus is dead so that god can be glorified and i think that that's really interesting so looking at both of those that 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 specific tie-in with God being glorified, um, you cannot ignore the fact that when Jesus talks about the Father being glorified, how is the Father being glorified? He's being glorified by the Son, not only pronouncing the truth, but also exhibiting power. Power that identifies the Son with the Father. Now, this, again, I, I want to go back and remind us that just as these seven miracles were placed here very intentionally by, by, by the Apostle John, we have to take another step back and say, well, why? Why? Well, we know uh, that the proto-Gnostic teachings were teaching that the God of the Old Testament was evil Christ had nothing to do with the God of the Old Testament. Well, John is revealing that Jesus is, in fact, the God of the Old Testament. We, we can't miss that part. Because what John is doing, and by the way, he starts in the very first verse 
of this gospel. But what he is doing is he's absolutely, it's like he's, he takes these seven miracles. If you think about it, think of the proto-Gnostic teaching as a building. And, and John goes to the foundation of that building and he drills seven holes in seven key parts of the building and puts the dunamis, uh, you know, the power of God in there. And he just lets it rip. And that whole building's going to come down of Gnostic teaching. It's, we, we cannot, and, and people say, well, yeah, but he was also giving new information about Christ. Well, absolutely he was. And he, oh, he was also teaching about the love of God. Absolutely he was. But none of those are mutually exclusive to the fact that, that John was combating a teaching, a heretical teaching that was affecting the church. And he was able to combat that teaching by emphasizing the love of Christ in the unity of the Trinity and the power of God, the connection of the Father and the Son, he was able to, to utilize all of that, the love of God, new information, in order to affect a demolition of proto-Gnostic teachings. And it's really interesting, you guys, it's very interesting that it, it, it wasn't too long before those Gnostic teachings ended up in oblivion. We did not hear about Gnostic teachings until the Da Vinci Code. When the Da Vinci, when Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code came out, it re-sparked a interest. And if you ever watch, it's a good movie, but the stuff that 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 that, that they're saying is just complete garbage and bulldinky. But that kind of re-sparked an interest in the Gnostics. Um, but the fact is, is that they, they went into oblivion. Why did they go into oblivion? Because the Gospel of John and 1 John uh, created such a devastating argument against the proto-Gnostic teachings and created such a powerful um, argument for the Trinity and the unity of the Father and the Son that um, it simply couldn't stand. The Gnostic teaching simply couldn't stand. And so that, I mean, that that is why, you know, I always say it's so important that um, we have an, an understanding of the history behind each of these texts. You, were you raising your hand, Pat? I was. I, I didn't want to jump in there because you're on a roll. No, no, that's I wanted to ask ahead. you, though. Gnosticism started in the first century, so at this time it was proto-Gnosticism. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would call it proto-Gnosticism because it had not fully formed into what we know as Gnostic teaching, but all of the elements were there where Greek philosophy was being mixed with, and by the way, um, I think it was, I want to get this right. Philo, I think it may have been Philo, the philosopher. It was a Jewish philosopher who began to meld the Old Testament into Greek philosophy. So this wasn't a new approach. This had been done before, where uh, Jews had attempted to um, put Old Testament teaching on a higher level of social acceptance by melding it with um, Greek teaching. So this this is nothing new now. Some of the scholars, um, and these are people of the first and second century, say that the Gnostic movement was started by Simon the Sorcerer. 
And if you remember, Simon the sorcerer was the one that that attempted to buy the Holy Spirit, power of the Holy Spirit in Acts. And Peter leveled him. And uh, he had to be led out. But it the teaching is, or the word out, is that Simon the sorcerer was the one who started uh, the Gnostic movement. And then later, people like Valentinius and others, um, there, was diff there, was a lot, there was lots of different flavors of Gnosticism as they began to also not only mix Greek philosophy with, with, with the Bible, but also mi the mystery religions also. So there was just a lot of false teaching out of there. But what John is uh, hitting at is basically the very core of all the Gnostic movements, which is the identity of Christ. And you'll notice this, that every cult, Every cult, they attack a few things. They attack one, the Trinity. Mormons do it, Jehovah, which by the way, if you wanted to know if we have modern day Gnostics, I would say the Jehovah's Witnesses in many ways are modern day kind of refined Gnostics. Um, so the Mormons attack the Trinity. Jehovah's Witnesses attack the Trinity. Um, also, they attack the identity of Jesus Christ. Who is Christ? The Mormons say he's Satan's brother. Um, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses say he's a demigod. He's uh, a created god. Um, which is interesting because that really is Gnostic. The whole demigod thing. You know? And also... If you ever talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they go on and on about what thing? Knowledge. Knowledge. There are, and what is the word Gnostic? Gnosis. Knowledge. That's what it means. That's what Gnosis means. Knowledge. So it is interesting that, uh, um, that that's still there. Those teachings are still there even within the Jehovah's Witness um, cult. So you'll see a lot of those things. What's also attacked is the physical resurrection of Christ. The, uh, the Gnostics, uh, the Gnostics did not believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. And so remember, I had said that, that, um, that, that first John went out at the same time as, uh, um, let's see. Let's see if I can find it. Um, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Get that. Get that. This is First John. This is just reinforcing my premise on this book or my belief of what it was written. Listen to what John says. Who is the liar but he who denies that one, Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And the language there is bringing the Father and Son together. There's a denial of that. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, um, you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And then also, I want to see if I can where it says anyone, basically, it says anyone who denies, Robert, you'll find it for me, anyone who denies the physical resurrection of Christ is a liar is of the Antichrist. And 
The Jehovah's Witnesses, just like the Gnostics, do not believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. So you'll there's certain commonalities you'll see in the pseudo Christian um, cults, but uh, going on with with uh, John chapter eleven when last week we talked about this uh, Jesus saying and this is the point that I was making. Um, I'm glad that you know. Uh, you weren't there so that God can be glorified, just like he said with the man that was born blind, that God can be glorified. And that is this, that you cannot wiggle out of the sovereign hand of God that Lazarus's death was something that was under the sovereign control of God. And that just as the man was born blind was under the control of the sovereign will of God. So you step back. Tony, I'm sorry, your, uh, your mute got turned on. You just disappeared. Ooh, I must have pressed something. Okay, sorry about that. It's all right. Um, I was talking about the sovereign will of God. And, and some people have a real issue with the sovereignty of God. And I believe that that issue comes out of two things. One, it comes out of the pridefulness of the heart that thinks that we can control our destiny better than God. And the other, I believe, comes out of uh, unbelief. Uh, we don't trust God. We don't trust that God would do what is best for us. And when you... Uh, when you realize the sovereignty of God and, and you, you marry that with the character of God, I'm going to tell you right now, if you really understand the sovereignty of God and you bring that together with the character of God, you should put your head on your pillow at night with a smile on your face as you drift into peaceful slumber. Amy. I have a question. Um, so I was just while you were talking, I was doing two things at once. I was looking up a, a little thing on um in the on um the computer about Gnosticism. And one of the things they said is they also believe in like many levels of heaven. Is that correct? Well, uh they they do it's emanations of angels. That's why um think it's in Galatians where Paul talks about don't be caught up with controversies of angels and that's kind of he's talking about some proto-gnostic teaching there um, but again in that sense you can see the Mormon religion taking on some of those characteristics as well uh, it, there is yeah not wanting to get on too big of a rabbit trail but because the Gnostics believed that the flesh was evil, Sophia could not create the physical universe directly. She had to hand it down to an angel who handed it down to an angel and thousands of levels under that angel they created to separate her from, from the sinfulness of flesh. It, it's just so stupid. Uh, now, along really, with that, would there be the idea that if there is these different levels of heaven that, you know, man has to work to gain, you know, a well, better. It's, yeah. It's it all, listen, it always, you got two choices. There's only two choices. However you want to paint the portrait, there's only two choices. Either God is the one who initiates your salvation and he brings you into heaven by his power and grace, or you have to earn it. That's the only two choices. Christianity is the only one that teaches the one. Every other religion in the world teaches the other. Right. Everyone. Yeah, that's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. 
And sooner or later, the false prophet and the Antichrist are going to gather all of those false religions together to create one false religion. And I always say it's like this. Um, the, the gospel is the pearl of great price. Jesus is the pearl of great price. Satan has spent a lot of time creating counterfeit pearls. And in the last day, he will string all of those pearls into one necklace. And that will be your false church. Um, okay, one other question. Um, unless somebody else has a question. I just have a quick question. Um, okay, so... So all these other religions are praying to gods and stuff. And um but you take the Jew Jews, right? Yeah, you know, like the other day I was with a Jewish friend and um in a it was like in a situation he was doing a prayer um for people who had passed away, and then he says Amen, right? And um I'm thinking, well, Jewish people, I mean, they do believe in the real God, but they don't believe in the Trinity, right? So so who are they praying to? They're praying to God, but they don't have any access to him because they've refused the, the one mediator between God and man. Because they refuse the, um, the Jesus. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, okay, so getting on to this, we stopped in verse 27, I think, um, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he die, uh, if anyone believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So what is he doing? He's making a proclamation of, of what? Of his, uh, okay, when he says, I am the resurrection and the life, he is making a proclamation that he is the Messiah. God come down in the form of man. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And what is Jesus going to do? Now, again, let me take you back to the man born blind. What did Jesus do? Jesus said to the Pharisees, before uh, Abraham longed to see my day, and he saw it and rejoiced. And they said, you are only 30 years old. How do you know Abraham? And he said, what? Before Abraham was, I am. He declared himself to be God. Then immediately, what does the very next verse say? <clears throat> As he's walking out of the temple, he finds the man born blind, and he takes dirt and makes an eyeball out of it, just like the great I Am did in Genesis 1 with Adam. Now, follow this. Jesus once again makes a statement. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm the Messiah. I'm God come in the form of a man. I have power over death, and I am the only one that can give eternal life, and now I'm going to show you. Just like what he did with the man born blind. Same thing. Makes an announcement, and then he shows the announcement in physical miracle. When she said this, you know, she said, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. When she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus, who had not yet, uh, who had, 
I'm sorry. Now, Jesus, who had not yet come into the village. Now, remember, he's staying outside of the village because the Jews are seeking to kill him. So he's outside of the, whether that's a quarter mile or a half a mile away, whatever it is, some distance away. Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him, which says what? Those who have a relationship with Jesus, those who truly believe in Jesus, when they hear the message, the master is here, they will seek him out. They will go be where Jesus is. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her, Uh, saw Mary rise quickly and go out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, so she is being followed by this crowd of people. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, she is about ready to receive an upgrade in Jesus 2.0. Her relationship with Christ, um, sincere and full of faith, was that Jesus could heal anyone. But now she's going to see Jesus not just heal someone, but bring them back from the dead. So, Jesus is doing this not only to display his deity, he's doing it out of love for all of his disciples, including Mary and Martha, who are his disciples too, so that they can see and understand the power of what? The salvation he is bringing them. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Why do you think Jesus wept? He was empathetic to their, their feelings. I know that. Okay. I think that's right. Jesus wept for their unbelief. Was it because that he was like not personally experiencing it, but he was like a part of what sin was doing and like he was seeing the mortality of man and like the effect that it was having on the people around him? Nathan, gold star. That's exactly why Jesus wept. It was because he was weeping over the devastation and the cost of sin brought to man. Death. The ultimate price for sin. Not only physical death, but spiritual death. Certainly he was empathizing with their pain, absolutely. But this is what sin brings, the death of mankind, the physical death and the spiritual death. They said to him, Lord, come, okay. Uh, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some, can you, we just need to stop for a moment and think that, you know, okay. Have any of you ever had a time in your life where you were so in so much pain that just it was a guttural weep, a guttural cry. Have you ever had that before? This is what Jesus is doing. He's not just like tears rolling down his eyes. He's weeping. This is a, a similar, remember Peter wept 
Peter went out and wept when he denied Christ. This is a, a very deep, because the Jews said, oh, wow, look, look how much he must have loved this, this guy. This is a um, very, very deep, guttural, emotional response, powerful, physically dis disabling response. He didn't just shed a few tears. Okay. He was on his knees, head in the dirt, face in the dirt, uncontrollably sobbing. Have you guys ever been to that place? Had that time in your life where you're on your face is in the ground and you're uncontrollably sobbing. Now, Jesus was sobbing for you. Yes, I did. Jesus was sobbing for this, the, the death of man, the penalty of their sin. And I think we can read that Jesus wept in such a short verse. And we think, oh, he sat down on a tree stump and, and shed a few tears. No. That's not what happened. That's not the visual here. This is devastating sobbing. Weeping. Very strong. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. But the and I and I want to stop there you guys cuz I want to leave you with this visual of Jesus with his face in the ground <coughs> sobbing over what sin is doing in our lives. 